Martin Bell was the most talented of the Gregory Fellows in poetry at Leeds University. And uh, his great champion was the late Peter Porter. But for some reason, I never got in touch with Porter and he died last year, which was very sad. The um, complete poems were edited by Peter Porter and um, these are some of his very best poems which I don't think anyone else really has ever managed to surpass, particularly El Vestichado, which was what Bell called a Gothicised version of Nerval. Look for me in the shadow, a bereft one disconsolate. Prince of Aquitaine and heir to a ruined folly, one star was mine, gone out now. My starred loot goes in dark circuits with the sun of melancholy. Oh, to console me in my graveyard midnight. Bring back Basilipo and Italy's seas, the flower that was my sad heart's favourite, and friends are rose and vine there, binding trellises. Am I Eros then, or Apollo, Lucinian or Byron? My brow burns red still, which the Queen has kissed. I have lingered in caverns where the sea nymphs choir, and twice a conqueror swum the straits of Acheron mingling alternate strains on Orpheus' lyre, sighs of the anchorite, wailing of the possessed. Usum Kassan as poet Modi. Is it not brave to be a king to shells? Usum Kassan and Theridamus, is it not passing brave to be a king and ride in triumph through Persepolis. Noses in books, odd children in good schools, get praise by being clever, and they sing revenge on the fortunate, the easy-going fools, and think it passing brave to be a king. King, then, but of words only. There's the rub. Action is suspect and its end uncertain, Stuck in a job, or browned off in a pub, or fated and then stabbed behind a curtain. Impatiently they strain their eyes to see small faults through powerful lenses, angrily snatch at paradise, exacerbating their five senses. Famous young Rambo managed rather better, crammed all he could beneath his greedy hide, went to Abyssinia wouldn't write a letter, was made into a saint before he died. The next poem of Bell's I'm going to read is The Enormous Comics. Um, this was one which obviously is in the complete poem, but it also particularly struck me when Bell was included in, I think, the second volume of the 27-volume series of Penguin Poets published in the 60s, which was probably the most interesting series of poetry books ever produced in this country. Uh, Penguin tried to bring it back with a mixture of new gen poets, but it was such a disaster, the series very quickly was finished. The Enormous Comics, a teacher to his old school. Barnacled in tattered pomp. Go down, still firing, battered admirals. Still go down with jutting jaw and tutting tooth and tongue, commanding order down cold corridors. Superbly, O oh, dyspeptic hamlets, pause in the doorway, startle the fourth form with rustlings of impatient inky cloaks. Time and time again you go into your act. Benevolent and shaven, K 
county cricketers, heroes on fag cards, lolling out of the frame, or smug and bun-faced happy families are swollen in shrill rage, off with his head. You lean huge areas into close-up with cruel pampered lips like Edward G. Robinson, or trace his anguished eyes, and still remain the seediest of grandees. Processed, hierarchically larger than life, gigantic Guy Fawkes masks, great heads on stilts. Your business was traditional, strictly articulated into timetables, only a few steps from nightmare. Wild clowns will terrify, wagging a wooden phallus at the crowd, raising a roar of response of love and loathing, fat scapegoats stuck with brow, broad rosettes of learning. I listened and made myself still as a mouse, watching the growlish, growling pusses and their antics. Now I see in the back room of any classroom sharp, impatient eyes weighing me up for the drop. Large masks creak. Sir will tear a passion to tatters. One must pray for unobstructed moments, for chances to be useful. Like theirs, old wretches. Like theirs. A prodigal son of Volpone. Conspicuous consumption? Why, Volpone would splash it around as if he could afford it. Wore himself out for his craft, a genuine phony, who only wanted gloatingly to hoard it. His son had sprung like a mushroom, pale in an alley. Reluctant, they had to unload the stuff on him to cook the accounts, got Mosca back from the galleys. These lawyers worried that the air looked dim. What was he now to do with all this gold? His father withered in prison because of it, Root of all evil, he'd always been told, by scholars who'd brought him up. Get shot of the lot of it. Gloomy vaults, cram full roof high with piles of metal and stone and paper shoveled into sacks. A great city sewer, bustling gold mines swollen for carnival. Must give it back. Somehow get rid of it. Be a big spender. The tradesman knew of a new purse spilling around. Not a junk shop of Venice that wasn't stripped of its splendour. Not a period piece, not an objet d'art to be found. How richly the monde assembles his parties. How thickly clustered in slow gilded whirls. Sensitive businessmen and butch aesthetic hearties. Senile young statesmen, faint expensive girls. Spend it faster, he'd pay on the nail for their answers. A patron's deep waving harvest was quick to be seen. A sculptor in barbed wire, a corps of Bulgarian dancers, three liberal reviews and a poetry magazine. Mosca's smirk broadened. The foundation showed a profit. How white and stammering. Now, our Volpanetto. Give it to the city, see the poor get some of it. He vanished aboard a waiting Vaporetto. For one odd halfpenny, Mosca broke on the rack. The Senate's liver was hardened with golden wine. Some money drained to the poor. The young man never came back. Last heard of was herding swine. Or turn to swine. I don't know what it is about Martin Bell's poetry. There is clearly a humour. There is an irony. There is a self-mockery. Uh, but none of the other poets in the group. Poets like Redgrove. Um really lived up to Martin Bell. He was essentially and clearly the best poet of that group and probably the only one who will really survive. This poem is called Headmaster Modern Style. It's dedicated to Philip Hobsbawm who was a very minor poet indeed but was the actual creator of the group. This leader's lonely, all right. He sees to that. Inspectors, governors, parents, boys and staff. His human instruments are all shocked back. From the stunned area around him, the sound of his voice. Wag, wag of tongue is his wig and his weapon. 
raking a stamping ground for his mannequin's hard-headed strut in a neat grey suit. For those licorice all sorts, his barrow boy eyes, shrewdness and suspicion go on and off like traffic lights, for the maggot twitch at the end of his almost endless nose. What a nuisance a little man is. If two stay behind, what to paint scenery, and he offers to help, they toss for who does the painting and who listens to him. Snitch, the boys call him, snitch or conk. Rats, he calls them, slackers, dirty rats. No room for gothic ghosts here. In the gleam of the public urinal type 1870 tiles, there's a really up-to-date practical talking poltergeist. Resounds all day throughout the shameful building that can't be prettied up, although they try. It talks to the contractor's men on their small jobs. He must slow them up. And what does he talk about? Well, what was it? Imagine a five-act opera with only one voice. Continuous recitativo, secco monologue. But in real life, and what is it all about? It is for something, and it isn't for you. It isn't something he'd want your opinion for. he got it all worked out. He knows his line, anecdote, and anecdote and anecdote. To keep him talking, not to listen to you. Slugged into acquiescence by his knowing drone. This poem goes on pattering just like he does. This is the way to elicit expensive equipment. The Burgess are pleased to be stung for expensive equipment. Quite a lot of it the poor little re wretches can't read. New vistas in education, shining technical vistas, showers and lathes and ropes and coats of paint, a new laboratory, new woodwork shop, new metal workshop, shelves in the library, elegant functional tombs, where William, Biggles, Bunter rest in peace. The boys should be grateful for all the equipment they're getting. Let's finish this business off. Let's talk to the backwardest class, to we say, up the last stairs to the art room. They are so eager to do something that they keep being awkward, knocking things over, sit still and attend, give out the dead clay, never mind if they get it all over their clothes, all over the desks, all over the floor. Right, now I want you to make a headmaster. They will solemnly prod into life long-snitched headmaster dolls. Nothing crude like sticking pins. Well, all right then, we will stick pins then, but also... Shove in chewed bubblegum to make his eyes. Give him a surplus of toffee paper and hymn book leaves. Let bottle tops stinking of yesterday's milk be gathered for his medals. I think one of the reasons I feel at home with Bell's poetry is, as I did, Bell taught, while well, I taught in a primary school in Leeds, Bell taught in a series of secondary schools in London but I think we both found teaching apart from my early period when I taught very bright children very bright ten year olds after that I think both Bell and I found secondary school teaching as very uh, very destructive of creative writing all the, the best jobs go to the Oxbridge graduates and neither Bell nor I were that. He went to Southampton University College in the 30s and I went to Leeds Teacher Training College in the 60s. And um, I think these experiences certainly marked us as poets and marked us as people and how people ever teach in the present situation where pupils seem to dominate the classroom instead of teachers I find it very, very strange. There is, in the title of a book I was recently reading, A Loss of Good Authority. And I think this is really the problem, this loss of good authority, which is very difficult to define.